right there is a place of surrender. You say we give you, I give you my heart and I give you my soul. Allow yourself just to surrender right now. Hallelujah. Some of you might have went through a hard week and had some serious situations that you might have faced today. But just give it all to Jesus right now. Give him your heart and your soul today. Hallelujah. What better person you can entrust your heart and soul to today? Father, we yield to you right now. We yield to your presence right now. I thank you, Lord God, for what you're about to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was already scripted, already in the manuscript for today, July 28th. Have your way in the lives of your people today. Hallelujah. We thank you and praise you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you right now. We praise you for who you are today. We get out the way, none of us and all of you. Speak to your people. Speak to my heart. Have your way in my heart. If there's any other time that we needed you, is today. We need you for today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday's gone. We need you for today. You know the troubles that suffice tomorrow. You know the troubles that are unaware that we don't even know. But thank you, Father. We come to honor you and give you your presence today. So we give you praise and honor for what you're about to do and say. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome. You are here. And we thank you for it, sir. We couldn't do nothing without you. Lead and guide us today into all the truth. The truth is what sets us free. And we need the truth today. Help us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Guide us, Lord. Direct us, Lord. Show us, Lord. And we'll give you the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. 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 Hallelujah. Such a sweet spirit in here. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want to start off by just uh, thanking God for each and every one of you. Thanking you all for uh, your presence today. Thanking God for uh, Apostle Arch and Pastor Kevin and all of you in your rightful places, all your leaders. I just thank God for your musicians. Thank God for you. Uh, let's open up our hearts today. Amen. Amen. Let's open up our hearts to receive the word of God. If you open up your heart today, one of the things I'm learning in, in my own life as I continue to uh, go into things of God, there are things in your life that in order for God to build and plant, there has to be a turndown. And turndown doesn't feel good. So one of the things I've learned about building and planting is that before you can build or plant, many of you uh, have renovated a house one time or another in your, in your lifetime. You know that that house looks like it may not have any potential, but after a while, you know that some things are going to get torn down so that you can rebuild. Amen? Amen. Nothing wrong with that. Come on, church. One of the things about dealing with strongholds and casting down images in your mind is to turn down some things. There are things that have to be torn down at all times in our life. As long as you're on this earth, you're going to be doing some renovating. Amen. Would you agree with that? As long as we're in the earth, we're going to have to do renovating in our minds. That's part of the warfare that we all deal with. So one of the scriptures I want to share with you uh, today is uh, right there. He told this to Jeremiah. He said, see, today I have imparted to you great authority over nations and governments to uproot and demolish, to destroy and dismantle, and you will plant and build something new. Before you can ever plant and build something new, things have to be destroyed and dismantled in our mindsets. Amen. That's all of us. This is not, that, was just not, that was Jeremiah's ministry for the nations. But what is your ministry? What has God called you to? What are the things that God is building so he can bring things new in your life that has to be dismantled? How many of you know it don't feel good when stuff getting torn down? Especially if you've been living off of it for a long time. Different mindsets that we may have accumulated over, the, over our lifetime that is hard to destroy when the word of God comes in and have to dismantle some things so that he can have the room. Say room. Make room for Jesus today. They didn't make room for him when he was born on the earth. You got to make room so that he can begin to build and plant in your life. Amen. Another verse of scripture. Because my wife has a subject she wants to share on. I'm just going to be here to support her and just kind of uh, uh, come in. 
we've been studying together. It's been exciting, you all, how uh, God is allowing us to come together and study together. And it's bringing more of a more intimacy in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, go to the next one, Sister, uh, Sister Tosh. I want y'all to see this. Ephesians 1, verse 4. That's in the mirror translation. Listen to this verse, verse 4. God associated us in Christ before the fall of the world. Listen to this. Jesus is God's mind made up about you. Jesus is God's mind made up about you. So what, what is that saying to you? I'm going to read the rest of it so you uh, finish the verse. He always knew in his love that he would present us again face to face before him in blameless innocence. How many of you ever had your mind made up about something? Raise your hand if you ever had your mind made up about something. So if you know how it feels when you had your mind made up, how much more our Heavenly Father has made up His mind about Jesus Christ on the inside of you. God's mind is already made up about you, and it's in Christ Jesus that He made up His mind. He didn't make up His mind in nothing else but in Jesus Christ. Amen? So what are you saying, Pastor Cook? So if God made up His mind, in Jesus Christ. Listen to this now. And I've been teaching that Jesus is full of grace and truth. In verse 14 of John 1. Verse 16 says that of that fullness, of that abundance, full of grace and truth, you and I must receive grace for grace, spiritual blessing for spiritual blessing, gift heaped upon gift. That's the Amplified. You must begin to receive what God has for you out of Jesus' fullness. God's mind is made up about this. We can't change it. It's already been done. It's already been settled in heaven. And if you and I begin to receive God's abundance of grace, you and our lives are going to change. But here's the trick. The enemy don't want us to turn down the strongholds in our minds. So we start dealing with things that are, have been there for so long, and it takes a little longer to turn stuff down, especially if it's been built up and made a stronghold. Think, remember I was telling you about trying to break out of prison. They make strongholds for prisons. And after a while, you know, a person is taking his time. It takes a little while. That's why God began to show me as a shepherd to be patient. Do it in love. Everything you got to do in love. You know, you got to start doing it in love, Byron. You got to be better at this so that you can learn how. Because watch this. There's a, a place where the enemy tries to snare us and hold us captive in that area. And if, and if we don't begin to understand that we may be captivated in the area, of, in our mindset, in our life, then how can somebody ever free you if they don't do it in love or can't do it in a way where you can get it presented and learn how to walk in this thing? Amen? So I want you to understand that out of this fullness, out of God's fullness, we receive grace for grace. Amen? One more verse of scripture, then I'm going to let my wife get into our subject. Uh, the next verse of scripture says, uh, Acts. No, that's it. that's it. She starts. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Jude chapter 1. All right. Um, the title of this message today is called Take Cover and Look to Grace. Take cover and look to grace. So you're probably saying, what do, what do you mean by take cover? You know, I was in a conversation with one of my sisters um, not too long ago during a, a hair braiding session. And she said that God had told her um, to get positioned and to get to the church. Get into the church. That means take cover. God was saying that I want you to be in my word. I want you, you can't be out there. I need you to take cover and taking cover is inside the church. Amen. We live in a time, whether you realize it or not, or whether you agree with me, maybe you are educationally, uh, maybe you got a doctorate, or maybe you are in the political realm, but whatever that may be, we are in a, a time where there are all types of uh, doctrines and all types of teachings out out there amen and so we you know God loves us so much he loves you and I so much this small remnant right here he wants to forewarn each and every one of us amen it's awesome to be able to come into the house of God and to give God praise and to shout unto victory amen but it's another thing when the Holy Spirit begins to talk he wants to he wants that's why I believe the praise and worship was a little bit a, a real smooth real sweet this morning because God wants to speak to our hearts today about false teachers so when the title is known as a take cover and look to grace that's exactly what he's saying he's saying this and I don't want my people out there just listen to this and listen to that you get pulled astray in this area pulled astray in this area and then before you know it you're confused don't you remember John 10 and 10 the thief coming to kill steal and to destroy and that's exactly what he 
who does. Amen? So just because you may not be up here preaching the word don't mean that you don't have a target on your back. Say amen to that. Amen. So we must take cover and look to grace. So that's what this message is all about. Let's look at Jude uh, verse 3. He says, Beloved, my whole concern was to write to you in regard to a common salvation. Now Jude is just one simple chapter here, right? But if you kind of take some time, even when you get home and you look at the book of Jude, take a look at what he's addressing in this situation. Jude is talking about false teachers. He's talking about false pastors, false prophets, false shepherds. Amen? And he's talking about, he said, listen, I was going to write to you about something else. Amen? He said, I had a whole nother agenda. I was going to write to you. Amen? But the Holy Ghost took over. Amen? And that's how sometimes it is. Sometimes you have one, one, one main mind, your mind made up in some things and you're going around, but then the Holy Spirit will come in and he'll just turn you a different way. Let's look at what Jude says. He says, Beloved, my whole concern was to write to you in regard to our common salvation. That means he was going to share some things about the gospel. Common salvation. But I found it necessary and was impelled to write you and urgently appeal to and exhort you to contend for the faith. Amen. Somebody say contend for the faith. We are in time right now where our faith is always being challenged. If you go on social media, there's somebody there that is either anti-Christ, anti-grace, anti-love, anti-peace, and they may be anti-you as well. <laughs> Amen. There's all kinds of antis out there. It used to be a time where we would discuss about the anti-Christ, but now there's all anything that's, that, that stands for you, and everybody just anti-everything. Just anti. He just got antis all over the place. <laughs> he says, but it was an urgent, it was urgent appeal to exhort you to contend for the faith. That means that you're going to have to know what you're talking about. That means you're going to have to know what you're standing on. Amen? You can't be just, a, sometimes I'm in my word, sometimes I'm not in my word, sometimes I pray, sometimes I can't pray. No, it's an urgency. Amen? It's an urgency. Hallelujah. You start right where God puts you at. You don't have Amen. You don't have to pray for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or one hour, but start wherever God puts place you at. Hallelujah. If you know one scripture, take that one scripture, pray on it. You take that one scripture, spend five minutes. Yes. None of us should be ever too busy, and we can't spend no time in God. So Jude said, he said, you have to contend for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints, the faith which is at the sum of Christian belief. Your faith is on the line all the time. We may not live in a third world country. We may not be over in the Middle East where we have our churches in the basement, our churches underground. But our faith is out there. Amen. We're challenged all the day long. Satan has his foot soldiers outside all the time. And they have implemented, they, some of them in the church, fallen angels in the church. Some are on your job. Some of them in the educational department. Some in the political department. Amen. So he said, which was delivered verbally to the holy people of God. Next verse. He said, for certain men have crept in stealthily, gaining interest secretly by what? A side door. A side door. A, they, he didn't say an open door. He said a side door. That means the devil has come in real subtle, real subtle, making you think it's all right. I'm just talking about Jesus. You hear me? I'm just talking about Jesus. But all along, it's another agenda. Amen? Say another agenda. Satan has another agenda. And what happens is he don't just automatically just jumps out and say, aha, here I am. No, he's settled about the matter. He said about the matter. That means he studied you. That means he knows that you love God. He knows that you're standing for God. He knows that you can do things for God. So he's steady and he's smooth like a smooth operator. He said he came in secretly by a side door. You know what? I'm going to talk to the singers. I'm going to switch just for a moment. If you're a singer, you know it's so very vital. As you be careful, you wait on God. Because a man or a woman, they can slide right on into your life. And before you know it, you held captive, you in bondage. Wait on God. Their doom was predicted long ago. Ungodly, impious, profane persons who pervert the grace, the spiritual blessing, and favor of our God into lawlessness and wantonness 
and immorality and disown and deny our soul, Master and Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. So Jude was saying, listen, they come in through a slide door. They come in secretly. They pretend they all about Jesus, but they pervert the gospel, perverting the truth, pervert the cross, pervert the things that our master, the Lord himself, done on the cross for you and I. They pervert it. That means that they'll go anyway. Lewdness, shrewdness, big words, fancy words, fancy clothes. All just to wrap you all up. So you got to beware. You got to beware and take cover and look to grace. Because the whole thing is that the enemy wants to, if he can capture you up here, he got everything up you. Amen. We always look at children and play those uh, video games about zombies where there's a such thing as spiritual zombies. Right. Hallelujah. I don't care if you agree with me or not. There is a such thing as spiritual zombies. That means that the enemy has captured and possessed the human being to do and, and be whatever it is that they tell them to be. So we cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. I know it feels good to give God a shout. I know it feels good to say, ooh, hallelujah. But we must understand that there is an enemy that's on the outside. Don't let the enemy creep in your houses. Don't just play anything. Don't just go here and go there. Don't just listen to anything. Praise God. So we must take cover. As Tasha begins to go over to uh, Matthew uh, chapter 16, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about this particular verses that we're going to come up with, Matthew 16. You know, Jesus in all of the scriptures in the New Testament, he always has a run-in with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Always. You know, Jesus is always rebuking them and all, all the time, and everything they say, because it's always a, free, a false pretense with the, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They always dress up all pious, got big hats, and they, thou art the Lord. But on the inside, they're ravenous wolves, ravenous wolves. They look good on the outside, but on the inside, they have a black heart. So Jesus always rebukes the Pharisees and Sadducees. It was the Pharisees that believed that uh, they, they believed completely in the Torah, strictly purity laws, rituals, and beliefs, beliefs and traditions of their fathers, the Sadducees, they uh, did not believe but rejected belief in angels and demons attributed to all free will. So you have these two uh, sects that are in the Bible that Jesus himself has a run in. And he puts that, I believe, in the Bible to let us know that these types of people, they are out there in the world. They just all dressed up. It's the same spirit, but they just all dressed up and they just in the year of 2024. Amen. But the word of God, yes. With the Pharisees and Sadducees, as the Lord was saying, that uh, there were two uh, sects of people. One believed in the power, the other one didn't. Sadducees didn't believe in no power or resurrection. Didn't believe in angels or none of that. Pharisees did. But they both were against Jesus. So here's the thing I'm trying to get you to see in our modern day society. We have different uh, different religions that believe one thing and they against one another, but yet at the same time, they still not understanding or acknowledging grace. So you got a Pharisee, Pharisee sect and a Sadducee sect, and they're both saying crucify him. Crucify him. But one one believes in the power of God. One believes in the resurrection. The other one over here say, no, nah, we don't we don't believe that, but we believe in the same God you believe in. Well, how can and we got that right now today. We got people who don't believe in the power. Don't believe that God can heal their body. Don't believe that the power of God will knock you right in this floor. But it's the truth of the matter that we still deal with that in this time. So I just wanted to say that. All right, verse 11. How is it that you fail to understand that I was not talking to you about bread? So in this conversation, even from the beginning of verse 1, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples about bread. Now, on the natural sense, the disciples say, oh, he's talking about, Jesus tells them to beware of the leavened bread. But in their minds, they're like, oh, Jesus is talking about the natural bread. <laughs> so Jesus says, how is it that you fail to understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But beware of the leaven, ferment of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So God is saying, even today, in this church, he says, beware. Beware of false doctrine. Beware of things that are out there do not glorify Jesus. That are not in content about what Jesus is doing in your life. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus does not want you to be in bondage. It is not God's will that you be sick. It's not God's will that you be poor. Jesus wants to set his people free. So he tells them, he says, beware of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Verse 13. Now when Jesus went into the region of Syria,
Sarah, Sarah, uh, Caesar, I was going to say Caesar, Philippi, he asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? We're coming to a point. People from all over the world, they're going to see that light on the inside of you. And they're going to say, who do you say Jesus is? Do you think Jesus is just some common, average prophet? You think he's just a somebody? They're going to ask you that. Be ready. And the answer, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you yourself say that I am? How important, you know what, how important is Jesus to you? I mean, what do you say in your own personal life about Christ? Do you, do you, you pretend when you're around other people? Well, you know, what are you saying about Christ? What are you saying about him, the Lord himself? The master, the anointed one, the Messiah. He said, then Jesus answered them, blessed, verse 17. I'm going to skip over Peter, it's all right. Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are you, Simon bar -Jonah. Now, I skipped over 16. It was by mistake. He's, asked, he's actually talking to Peter. And then he says, for flesh and blood, men have not revealed this to you, but my father, verse 18, who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. Petros, a large piece of rock, and on this rock, like Gibraltar, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment or hold out against it. Let me stop right there. So, when we talk about, as I talked to Pastor Cook about this, we talk about the, the gates of hell should not prevail, all right? It's a couple of ways that you can, you know, from God's perspective, of course, and keeping it in content with Scripture. There's the gates of hell cannot push or move the church off its stance. I don't care what social media say about the church. They say the church is weak. They say you can't find refuge in the church. You can't do this in the church. Don't go to church. Don't be in church. No. Go to church. Amen. Go to church. Be in the presence of the Lord. You can, the gates of hell can't move the church of God off its stance. Christ has already defeated yeah. all forms of hell, all principalities, and all powers, and all rules, and all realms. God himself takes over all nations. Yeah. Glory be to God. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the anointed one. He is Christ the Messiah. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind, declared to be improper and unlawful on earth, must be what is already bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, declared lawful on earth, must be all what is already loose in heaven. Keep going. Then, then he sternly and strictly charged and warned the disciples to tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth, Jesus began clearly to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the high priests. Going up, Sister Tasha. Thank you. You can stop right there. Because I kind of got a little bit uh so, verse 25, let's go down here. Yeah. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here, shall lose it, eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here, for my sake, shall find it, life everlasting. I'm going to pause right there just, just a little bit, just a little bit. You got something to say before I, I'm, I'm going to elaborate this. I'm, go back up to 25. I, I want to look at this. For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort, security here shall lose it eternally. Let me just let me just kind of stay there just for a moment. You can't put your trust in material things. You can't put your trust in things that, like this. You, you can't put your trust in it. It will always fail you. But the word of God will never fail. So, you know, it gets to a point in your life, the question comes up and the statement comes up that we all have a cross to bear. Just because we preach and we teach and others preach and teach, that doesn't mean that you don't have a cross to take. All, every last person, including children, you have a cross to bear and take up. 
Amen? But it's up to you. It's up to you to work alongside with the Holy Spirit. It's up to you to say, God, yes, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to surrender, Lord. Use me right where I am. It's up to you. All of us have a cross to bear. But you can't put your, you can't put your whole life and all your thoughts into material things. And then I like at the end, it says, and whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here, for my sake, shall find it. That means that if you say, Lord, I'm not going to trust in anything in this world, I want you to do a great work in my life. You have already gained eternal life. Could it be? Could it be that all these years, no matter how old you may be, could it be that, you know, God is still waiting on you to accept what he's already asked you to do? Could it be that God is waiting on you to take up your cross, to do the things that he called you to do? Have we skipped out on time? Have we skipped out on the Lord? Have we skipped out? Or we just, you know, on social media, getting our hair done, doing all this, doing, 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 doing. So busy doing that we're not being. Go to Romans 8, 19. All right. I think I have that up. We must be about our Father's business. This is not a time. I urge you, this is not a time to be slothful. This is not a time to skip out. It's not. It's not the time. There are foot soldiers. When I tell you there are enemies out there just waiting, they are. So remember to take cover and look to grace. We have to be about our Father's business. The time is ticking. The hour is moving. The minute and the second hand are moving. And it's not waiting for you or I. So it's your choice. There's a fierce battle spiritually that's going on. You know, uh, you know, some people just kind of toss to and fro. You know, one moment it's like in order to fit in. You know, you, you're not going to fit in. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you know, there's no way you're going to fit in. The world is not going to want you. You know, so you can just stop all of it. Listen, I just want to help you. You know, some people say, if I lose 20, 30, or 50 pounds, that'll get me, I, I, I'll be accepted then. I'll be accepted if I, if I just dye my hair, if I just change my teeth, if I just change my body. I'll, I'll just fit in that way. It says, I think, so you say, I think I'll lose weight. Well, I'll move to another city. I'll just get a new house. I'll just get a new car. You ain't even trying to fit in. Stop trying to fit in. You're not going to fit in. Stop trying to make friends with the world. You're not going to fit in. God has something specific for you. God has sanctified, chosen you, set you apart. He made you the way he made you. You don't have to fit in. The world will just chew you up and just spit you on out. And then you'll be right back in Jesus. So you don't have to fit in. We don't have to look like each other. We don't have to make the world our friend. The Bible tells us that the world is enmity. We don't have to fit in. Get free today. Be free today. You don't have to sing like the world. You don't have to pray and do everything like the world. Do what God called you to do. Be an original. For even the whole creation, all nature waits expectantly and longs earnestly for the for God's Son to be made known. Waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. Yeah. It's waiting on you. In Psalms, one of the scriptures says, What is man that you are so mindful of him? He waits for you. He's waiting for you, Jonathan. He's waiting on you, Sister Vicky. He's waiting on you, Brother Harold. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting. He will go after the one. It can be tens of millions and millions and millions of people, but he's not going to drop you. So we got to stop living this life like we've been dropped, like we don't exist, like we don't have a voice. You have a voice. It's just that the world is not going to want you because you belong to Christ. You belong to Christ. Then, once you understand that it's God's love, you accept it and to be loved, then you can go and use the authority and rebuke the spirit of rejection. We, sometimes we put ourselves in the stream constantly of rejection because this person don't receive us. That person don't receive us. This company don't want us. 
lose all of that today. And think about the good things that God has for you. Hey Amen. Was that good with y'all? take it a step further because even in your born again experience you're going to understand too that uh, like my wife was saying that when we start losing things in our life you gain the eternal life that you need that God kind of life what happens is it's, it's hard to lose those things sometimes you don't want to lose the stinking thinking or the mindsets that have we gained security under some of us are secure under certain mindsets and God is saying you got to lose it this year as we go through this open door, we have to lose those mindsets, those things in our minds so that God can allow that life that you really desire. The rich young ruler desired that life. He had the, the riches. He was looking good and he was ruling. But he came and looked at grace. He looked right in the grace and said, man, what I want what you got. I don't care nothing about this money. They don't love me no way. I done had every woman I want. I know they don't love me. They don't want, want me for my money. He was young, so he didn't care about the youth part because he found out that how, how, I ain't even with my age group no more. I'm looking so young, I don't even look, look like everybody grew up with me. <laughs> if you ever see somebody in your class say, man, you like you 12. <laughs> I saw one of my friends, I was like, golly, dude, you a midget or something, man. You don't like you grown age, you a witch or something, man. I couldn't believe it. He said, I said, I'm, I said, I said, I'm 57. He said, I'm 59. I said, man, something wrong with her. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is we try to hold on to things, and those are the very things God wants us to. Grace will attract you. Once you realize this grace, it's going to attract us. Amen? So as Christians, this is what I want to show you. Go to Acts 14, Sister Tasha. Because one of the things that I've, I've always had to uh, deal with as a, as a pastor and a teacher, and I'm, I'm going to share this with you all, as you begin to walk more in the understanding and receive of its fullness, you're going to get attacked. That's obvious, church. You're not going to get attacked by the world because the world don't care about Jesus. You're going to get attacked by those that don't understand yet. Amen? So with, with the lack of understanding of God's grace and what she was saying about uh, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, that's unrestrained action. So what they were doing is, watch this, you all. They was taking grace and saying, oh, people preaching grace and you can do whatever you want to do and say whatever you want to do. But no, that's a lie. God will get you. No, 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 no. You ain't understanding grace then. Because grace has nothing to do with unrestrained action. You don't, you don't get a license to sin when you're under grace. When you're under grace, you're free from sin. You're free. The law dominates you. Grace frees you from sin. Romans 6, 14. Amen? This is not scripture that we got to start getting you all. So what has happened over the years, this is what God showed me for my life. For 20 years, I was stuck and I couldn't see grace through the Bible at all. All I saw was religion. I saw different doctrines and different beliefs and this is how you do it. This is how church is supposed to be run. And I looked through all of that stuff, church, and man, I'm telling you, I was like, God, what's going on? And he's like, well, you're wrong if you do it this way. You're wrong if you baptize it this way. There were all these things. Paul said, listen, I'm glad I didn't baptize none of y'all. That's what he said in Galatians 1. He said, I'm glad I don't want to get into religious debates. What I want, I want is Jesus. All I want is Jesus, church. All you should want is Jesus, amen? So then, I want to show you this because this is what the power, I want to show you where power resonates from. Real, eternal power. I'm, I'm going to show you where real, eternal power resonates from. Acts 14. I got it on my phone. Ha, ha, ha. Acts 14. God is freeing us, you all. He's freeing us. This is it, all. Acts 14, verse 2 of the TPT says this. Some of the Jews refused to believe, and they began to poison the minds of the non-Jews to discredit the believers. Yet Paul and Barnabas stayed there for a long time, preaching boldly and fearlessly about the Lord. Many trusted in the Lord. Watch this. Many trusted in the Lord, for the Lord backed up his message of grace with miracles, signs, and wonders performed by the apostles. We are finna get through that open door where you really see real miracles, signs, and wonders in your life. Some of you are looking for a miracle in your life, a real miracle in your life, where it's gonna change your life forever. There's some things that have happened over the years in my own life that just didn't stick. 
And I couldn't understand. I thought there was something I did wrong. Lord, why I feel this way? I thought I was delivered from that. Lord, I thought, what happened? And finally, God was showing me under this message of grace. When we understand, you see Jesus more clearly. And by God, God will back up this message. God is backing up Jesus. He's not backing up me. He's backing up Jesus. Amen? And through this message, you're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. I know some of you looking for it. I know it. It's, 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 listen, some of the miracles you're going to see, they're going to be beyond what you can imagine. It's one thing to see a miracle in somebody else's life. It's another thing to experience it in your own personal life. Give me an amen for that. Amen. How many you ready for a miracle? Raise your hand if you're ready for a miracle. Hallelujah. Come on now. This is the response to Jesus Christ. Those of you that raise your hand for a miracle, expect a miracle today. As we continue to continue in this word of grace, God has to do that. I can't do it. I have no power. I have no power. I know this fits seems sad to some people. Pastor Cook has no power. Jesus has all the power. Amen. He will authorize it through the message of grace. If you and I begin to allow and come into unity and begin to receive this word with meekness and allow the grafted word to save your mindset, your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. I'm thinking. That's why God said you got to let go of the thinking. Will you please today begin to let go of all the thinking and say, God, I surrender to you. I surrender my mind to you. I surrender my thoughts that I might have thought it was supposed to work this way. Lord, show me. Show me. Lord, uh, allow yourself to build up your implant in my life as you tear down, reconstruct some things. Tear it down and snatch it away. I don't mind. I give it all to you today. I don't want to live this way, not another day. Tear it out of me so you can build on the right foundation in my life. Did that mean I hadn't been a Christian? Of course not. We go from glory to glory. Come on. God ain't mad at our ignorance. God just wants to get the truth to us. Amen? But pride says, I don't want the truth. I know the truth. I'm free from all of that. I'm free. And I'm telling you today, until we break that spirit of pride on our own lives, and everybody individually here that's accountable for their own salvation, you got to break it for yourself. You can't look around and ask anybody, oh, they're going to break theirs. You got to allow the spirit of God to break it for you. Amen? And say, God, I surrender to you. Turn it down today. Hallelujah. Every stronghold and everything that is not like you and that does not exalt the knowledge of this grace, turn it down in my life. Amen? Let somebody come up to you and say, you know, I know you've been a parent for 10 years, you know, but uh, you ain't raising your kids right. Well, that's offensive. That's offensive because this is what's going to say in your heart. I've done all I can do. All I know how to do is try my best. I know that's what you would say in your heart. And God, being the God he is and the loving God he is, he's not going to come to you in that way. He's letting you know if you just surrender, I'll show you a more excellent way. I want to show you how to start now trusting in Jesus, full of grace and truth. That's why Bible revealed is so important, church. On Mondays, we're going through the journey of grace and truth and walking through every journey in each chapter and finding out so that we can get to the actions of the Holy Ghost of the church. I'm taking you from John and I'm taking you to all the actions of how this thing really happened in the early church. Say early church. So if God began this work in the early church, what make you think he ain't going to finish this work through the, through the church? What he started in the early church, it's not changing. This message is not changing. All of these things are part of us now entering into this era of our lives. Amen? If you understand that, give God a hand for us. He's not changing what's, what's going on through the church. Let's go to Galatians 2 real quick. This is the part that I want to really get to you all because the enemy, the enemy's whole job is to steal, kill, and destroy. You deal with a spiritual entity that tries to come against you and I at all times. For if I start over and reconstruct the old religious system that I had torn down, how was it torn down, you all? With the message of grace, I would appear to be a law breaker. Meaning this, God is tearing down things with this message, you all. There are things that are being turned, torn down in your, in your mindset. He's letting you know that he loves you in spite of. He loves you unconditionally. Some of you have habits. Some of you have addictions. Some of us are dealing with mindsets. I raise my hand. Some of you are dealing with things in your life. But I'm here to tell you, he loves you right where you are. And until you understand that, you will never allow that love to, watch this, to cover that multitude of, of 
error in your life, and you won't be able to go toward the love that's already waiting on you. So I'm asking you today, just begin to allow this message of grace. This is not just a message, it's a person. Jesus Christ, amen, he's full of grace and truth. Start receiving out of that, that fullness, church. I don't have nothing to give you. I'm, I'm receiving from the same spot you're coming from. Amen. I just got a gift on my life just like you have a gift on your life. But until you start receiving from this sp uh, spout and begin to calm down and let God just have his way in your life. Because what happens is he going to cause you to get still. The first thing God going to tell you to do is rest. That's the first thing. Before you can ever help somebody that's drowning, they got to stop. If not, they'll drown you. So God is going to allow you to keep on until you spin it all up. And finally, when you start sinking, you can say, save me, Lord. I'm tired of trying to do it myself. Lord, I need your help. Amen? So I want to encourage you all in this season of your life. Play a little music. Because you got one more scripture, right? Oh, you got one more Play a little music. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you right now. Hallelujah. I just, I want, I want, uh, I want an invitation. I'm inviting you, those of you that wrote, uh, raised your hand today, that believe that a miracle can take place. How I many of you need a miracle? Raise your hand again if you need a miracle. This is your time. I asked God, me and the boy been before the Lord all, all this week about this situation. I said, God, I want you to prove yourself through this message of grace. I'm sick of it. I said, I'm tired myself. I'm tired of people thinking that you ain't powerful as you are. I know I'm not powerful, so I don't have a, I don't have a problem with that. I want them to see that you are powerful concerning this message. That they don't have to do nothing. All they got to do is believe the truth about this thing. Amen? Believe that God can intervene in your situation. Part the Red Sea of your life. Some of you at the brink. You can hear the footsteps. You can hear the bills coming. You can hear the situation saying it ain't going to happen. But I'm here to tell you some of you at your brink and you at the right there for your miracle. Only God. Yeah, he'll use man. Yes, he'll use women. He'll use all of us to be able to be the hands that perform those things. But it's through God that he does it. Amen? So with that being said, would you just come up for a miracle today? I'm, I'm being bold about it. If you know you need you asking God for a miracle, let it happen today. Amen? Amen. You know ain't no other way around this thing. You know there ain't no other way you can get to this thing. God has to do this thing. A miracle. I'm looking for a miracle. Amen? A miracle. Hallelujah. I'm looking for a miracle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastors, come on, pastors. I need you. Hallelujah. There ain't no one that is. And I want everybody to know this. The enemy always tries to condemn us to make us feel like we're not worthy. Let me tell you something. Whatever he called you to do, he ain't changed his mind about it.